And you are all now being recorded. Are you, are you guys ready to go? Do you want me to go ahead and get started? Um, Jen, what do you think? Are we all hooked up? Yeah, um, yeah I don't have any uh, opening remarks or anything. So um, I guess, you know, thank you to our, our usual sponsors whose list I don't remember at the top of my head. Um, and I, you know, we have two more meetings scheduled uh, right now for July and August. Um, I don't remember the names of those off the top of my head either. Uh, one of them is related to cultural geology. Uh, Tom, do you remember the other one? Or Joanne? Come on, really? I know, the August one. <laughs> I was just, the only comment I was going to have was that we all recognize today was a historic day in that President Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act, creating a, a very important holiday, at least to me it is. And uh, if you don't know what that is, it's on, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you two sentences on June 19th, 19, 1865. Two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, federal troops rode into Galveston, Texas to inform the people that the slaves have in fact been freed. Two and a half years afterwards. And uh, this is the time to celebrate that yeah, and do a, a little shame. better than we've done in the past. Yeah, it's a shame it took us over 150 years to recognize that. We're not there yet, yeah. um, but we'll get there. Yep. All right, Bob, you're on, buddy. <laughs> okay, well, well, thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. And thank you, Joanne. Um, and thanks, too, to Nancy to uh, have this quick fix. This was outstanding. Uh, you know, yes. thinking, on, thinking on your feet and resourceful, uh, that was just outstanding. So very impressed with that. Yeah, thumbs up for that, too. Um, well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to come uh, and talk to the Long Island Association of Professional Geologists. Um, I'm going to talk about these tiny mineral inclusions that occur uh, up in the Garnets in Gore Mountain. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a great honor for me to, to be able to present this uh, to a group uh, such as yourselves. Um, so I always love a chance to get it uh, or to talk about some of the work that I've been doing and especially work that I've done with some colleagues of mine. Um, so again, uh, some of you are probably familiar with the garnet crystals at Gore Mountain. Um, I have an image over on the lower left-hand side uh, of a Barton Mine garnet. Uh, these are, we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail, but these are the largest garnets in the world. Um, there are no other reported occurrences of garnet that are bigger than the garnets at uh, Gore Mountain. I'd also like to just remind you that garnet is the official New York State gemstone. Um, it's a pretty hard mineral uh, and it obviously can cut a pretty nice uh, gem. And there is some gem quality garnet that occurs uh, at the Barton Mine. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, that as well. So let hey, me- Bob, uh, can I ask you, can I ask sure. you a question? Of course. When, when, when you did that, that garnet you have in the lower left, I see something there for scale, but I can't tell what it is. What? They're keys. To my oh, office. okay. Wow, that's big. <laughs> Those are my right. office keys. Yeah. <laughs> So that's probably, I'm sorry, yeah, that's a that's probably a 10 to 12 centimeter diameter uh, garnet. Um, so that's pretty that's pretty typical for uh, garnets at Gore Mountain. I'll show you a few more pictures as well. Okay, let me see if I can uh, advance the slides here. So um, what I'd like to share, uh, talk a little bit about the geology of the world's largest uh, garnet crystals. Um, I also want to spend time talking about these tiny mineral inclusions that occur inside the garnet. Um, and how we interpret them. Um, I'd also like to share with you um, some work that I've done recently with some colleagues uh, from Europe uh, on these garnets who are also interested uh, in these tiny little mineral inclusions. And I don't, I'm gonna you know, kind of skip to a little, a little part of the punchline, and, and that is that we think that these uh, mineral inclusions are igneous in origin. Uh, they're not metamorphic. Uh, we think that they are igneous minerals, and we think that they form from little tiny droplets of melt or magma that form inside the garnet. And I'll talk about the evidence for that uh, as well. So um, uh, the work that I've done with my colleagues from Europe, we've uh, gone ahead and confirmed the, this uh, melt inclusion hypothesis that I'll talk about. And then lastly, and, and really kind of most interestingly, 
um, the composition of these little tiny droplets of magma or melt inside the inclusion, ironically, have the same uh, composition as the very first continents on Earth. Okay, the oldest continental crust that we find has a, a magma composition or a mineral composition that's very similar to what we find inside these garnets of Gore Mountain. So we'll spend some time talking about that as well. So to kind of get started, um, I'd kind of like to start with the, the big picture and uh, work our way down to uh, tiny things inside of garnets. So here's a, a geologic map of the, of the North American continent, uh, and you can see the location of the Adirondacks that are shown in this sort of uh, beige colored uh, unit on the map. And uh, the Adirondacks uh, are part of this, they're part of an outlier of Grenville age rocks. So these rocks extend from the Labrador coast. Um, let me ask you guys, can you guys see my cursor in the image or no? Yes. 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 Okay, yes. okay good. Thank you. I just didn't know if you could see that or not. So, um, so these Grendel age rocks extend from the Labrador coast down through Quebec into Ontario. It captures part of New York, goes over in the Hudson Highlands, continues down through the Appalachian Mountains, uh, goes underneath the Mississippi embayment, reappears in the Llano uplift in Texas, and then is actually found down in Oaxaca State in Mexico as well. So it's a gigantic uh, belt of, of mountain building that occurred about a billion years ago. And so these rocks that we're looking at uh, that have the garnets in them are billion year old rocks that formed deep in the, uh, the Earth's continental crust during the Grenville orogeny. So here's a geologic map of upstate New York. Many of you are familiar with this. It's, a, it's the part of the New York State geologic map. This is the northern sheet. Um, and what I want to show you is uh, that there's a variety of rock types um, in the Adirondacks. This sort of area here, this kind of rounded area with all the brightly colored and irregular colored map units. Uh, these are all metamorphic and meta-igneous rocks of the Adirondacks. The most prominent body is this sort of yellow anorthosite body. There's some of these uh, purple gabbro units that you see here on the margins of the anorthosite. Then the rest of the rocks are, are mostly metagranites. There's some metasedimentary rocks. There are metacyanites, metacharnakites, more feldspar uh, rich rocks or more K feldspar rich rocks uh, compared to the more mafic rocks that are shown in the yellow and in the purple. Um, and again, all of these rocks are a little bit over a billion years old. I'm not going to go into the details of the specific ages of them, but they all formed as part of the uh, Grenville orogeny. And as far as garnet mining in the Adirondacks, um, uh, there were a number of garnet mines in the Adirondacks. The three biggest ones are the Barton Mine, uh, the Hooper Mine, and the Ruby Mountain Mine. Um, they're not mining at Barton anymore. They stopped that in 1983. Uh, the Hooper mine uh, stopped a few decades earlier than that. But today, um, the, there is a garnet mine that's active in the Adirondacks, and that's the one at Ruby Mountain. Okay. Um, and so, um, uh, so that's the only active garnet mine in the Adirondacks. Okay. Um, so, can you guys still hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. Hey, Chris is back. Yep. Oh, oh, good. I just got the, I just got a message that my internet server was disconnected. So I'm like, oh God, I hope that hope I didn't get disconnected from everybody. So, uh, all right. So if everybody can still hear, then I guess I'll continue. So this is a this is a close up geologic map of the garnet producing area uh, in the Adirondacks, and I just want to show you where the Barton Mine is located. Uh, it's down here towards the bottom. And you'll notice that the garnet deposit at the Barton mine is right along the contact between this purple gabbro rock and this sort of uh, tan colored cyanite um, that occurs at, at Gore Mountain. And in fact, there's a fault you can see on this map that, uh, that is, uh, separates the gabbro uh, and the anorthosite from the cyanite. And this fault is actually quite important in the origin of the garnet at Gore Mountain. We'll talk about that in a second. Hey, Bob, um, can I interrupt you for a second? Of course. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Chris is on the, I don't know where he is. He's on my other computer. Um, could whoever sent the link out, please send the link again to Chris? Sure. Chris Wenzel, thank you. I'm yep. sorry, Bob, to interrupt you. Well, that's okay. It, uh, you know, Chris, I'm sure would like to join. Yeah, I hear you, Chris. 
Oh, Alan, I'm sorry. Yeah, we had a little problem. It should be coming your way, Alan. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that, Bob. That's I'm sorry. Okay. Am I sending? Uh, I'm not sending this to Chris. I'm sending it to somebody else. Um, send Alan? it out to everyone. I did send it out to everyone. Okay. All right, we're good. Like, oh, they, hold on. <laughs> Can you send it to Chris Wenzel? I did. I sent it to the LIAPG Chris Wenzel account and to his uh, ERM account. Okay. All right. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Bob. Okay. We're back to normal. Go ahead. Continue, All please. Right. All right. Thanks. Uh, okay. So we were we were just sort of discussing the fact that the uh, the garnet deposit at the Barton mine is located at the contact between the gabbro that's shown in purple and the cyanite uh, to the south. And there's this fault that goes between them, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. But that's the biggest garnets in the world occur along this particular contact here in the Adirondacks. If we talk about the Hooper mine, uh, it's located a little bit to the north and west. Uh, it's mostly in a, a very plagioclase rich rock. Here's the anorthosite again. So it's a little bit more plagioclase rich mixed in with the garnet at the Hooper mine. And then the Ruby Mountain mine, where they're actively mining garnet today, that again is in an anorthosite body, the, the rock up there is very garnetiferous, but it has a lot of plagioclase in it as well. So the, the, the host rock is a little bit different between the Barton mine and the other two uh, occurrences. We're gonna focus um, pretty much all of our attention on the Barton mine in, in tonight's talk. So here's a, a, a close up geologic map of the Barton uh, deposit. And again, at the very bottom of the screen is that cyanite uh, that's shown in kind of pink color. Uh, and the gabbro is shown in green, um, and the garnet deposit is shown kind of in the center here uh, with this gray uh, sort of stippled pattern. Uh, and again, you'll notice that there's a fault, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a fault here uh, at the border between the cyanite uh, and what used to be the, the gabbro. And the idea here at Gore Mountain, there's a couple of important points that I want to make about the origin of the garnet. So, um, uh, it's important to know that the garnet uh, that occurs at the Barton mine is in a garnet amphibolite, okay? And an amphibolite, for, for those of you that may remember from your petrology classes, is a rock that's dominated by plagioclase and hornblende, okay? And the significant thing about the hornblende is that the hornblende has hydroxyls in its chemical formula. So that means that all hornblende has to form in the presence of some water, maybe a small amount of water, but it has to form in the presence of some water. Okay, and so the fact that this garnet deposit has that much hornblende in it tells you that its origin is related somewhat to water. And that's significant because the gabbro that occurs here in green, the gabbro is an anhydrous rock. It's made of pyroxene, and plagioclase and olivine, and none of those minerals have any hydroxyls in them, okay? And so what, we, what is widely accepted at Gore Mountain is that there was some water that penetrated the boundary between the gabbro and the cyanite along this fault. And that water reacted with the gabbro and converted it to a garnet amphibolite. That's the wide held theory about the origin of the Gore Mountain Garnet. And some people hypothesize that the presence of that water caused the garnets to grow really big in size. Uh, water is, a, is an, an excellent transporter of cations to sites of crystallization. And so some people hi have hypothesized that it was this abundance of water that caused these garnets to grow so big. Okay, so that's the kind of the long standing hypothesis and the reason for. Uh, why we think this garnet amphibolite formed by water being injected along that fault. Okay, we'll talk more about that a little bit later on. So I wanna show you a few more pictures of, of Gore Mountain Garnet. Um, you can see the garnets range in size from uh, you know, a couple of centimeters to maybe six or eight centimeters, 10 centimeters. Some of the big garnets might be about 30 centimeters. Um, the biggest garnet that was reported from this mine was a meter in diameter. 
Okay, and that that clearly is the that is the biggest garnet in the world. There's no other reports. It's not preserved anymore at Gore Mountain, but uh, that was what was reported in the in the historical documentation of the mine. Um, I might want to point out uh, that the garnet here, uh, a lot of the garnets are surrounded by this little rim of hornblende. It's pretty typical for it. But the host rock you can see is a mixture of this light colored plagioclase and dark colored hornblende. That's the garnet, that's the amphibolite of the garnet amphibolite. Okay, you can see it in, in the image on the right. Again, a mixture, the host rock is a mixture of plagioclase and hornblende. So it's typically a garnet amphibolite. And the garnet abundance is about anywhere from 10 to maybe 13% of the rock uh, that's, uh, that uh, makes up this garnet deposit. You'll also notice that the garnet is very highly fractured. All of the garnets at Gore Mountain have this very closely spaced uh, fracture pattern in them. It's not a cleavage in the garnet. It's a tectonic fracture. Uh, all of the garnets show this. Uh, it's related to some sort of tectonic event that uh, has never really been uh, studied before. Um, and the only place where we get gem quality garnets that is big enough and clear enough um, to make a gem quality mineral is if you find a place where those garnets, uh, the fractures in the garnet become kind of widely spaced. Most of them are a couple of millimeters apart, but sometimes they get to be maybe eight or 10 millimeters, maybe 12 millimeters apart. And that's the place where you usually find the gem quality garnet. So not all garnet at Gore Mountain is gem quality, only where the fractures are, are widest do you find gem quality garnets. But anyway, these are, uh, these are very large garnets at Gore Mountain. And they've always uh, interested or always have interested scientists from around the world. So I want to show you what these look like, uh, on, you know, kind of in a close up image. Um, the garnet that came out of the Barton mine, uh, the Barton mine was active for 100 years from 1878 to 1983. Uh, you can visit the Barton mine uh, today. Uh, they're not running uh, tours right now because uh, they have a hard time getting staff to, to run the tours, uh, as I'm sure some people probably know about is another problem uh, around the state. But anyway, um, this is what the garnet looks like up close. And there's two important qualities that um, are the reason why it's, it's mined in New York State. One, the garnet here in New York State has a pretty high hardness. Its hardness is about seven and a half to eight on the Mohs hardness scale. Uh, so it's pretty hard. And the other thing is that the garnet um, has a very pronounced uh, conchoidal fracture. And so when you break it, it breaks into these very sharp kind of uh, shards of garnet. Uh, so if you have something that's very sharp and very hard, uh, you can certainly use it as an abrasive material. And that's exactly what garnet has been used for for about 140 years um, in the Adirondacks. Um, and so uh, the biggest use of Gore Mountain garnet, or I should say Barton uh, garnet, comes from uh, sort of water jet cutting. Uh, if you combine this uh, very fine garnet that you see over here on the left, and you put it in a little tube right here uh, in this image, and you inject it into a high pressure uh, water jet, you can cut a lot of things with Gore Mountain garnet or with Barton garnet. And so its biggest use is in this water jet cutting uh, industry. So you can cut steel with it and cut all kinds of materials with it. Um, and it gets used quite often for, uh, for that purpose. And so uh, Adirondack garnet is shipped around the world. You can buy it in 55 pound bags if you want, uh, but they're still mining garnet today in the Adirondacks. Um, they're just not doing it at the, at the Barton mine. So this is a picture of the, of the Barton mine. This is down in the pit. Uh, again, uh, during non-COVID years, you can go and uh, take a tour and you can collect garnet here if you want. Uh, in the background, you see this is the garnet amphibolite. Uh, and in the far background is the gabbro uh, that the garnet amphibolite originated from. So if you, if you walk around on the, on the floor of the quarry, uh, you can see lots of examples of little pieces of horn blend and plagioclase and lots of little fragments of garnet. Uh, it's just laying in the quarry floor. So you can just go pick these up. Maybe you get lucky and find a gem quality one but the quarry is just, is just full of these little fragments of garnet. Uh, and so it's pretty easy to pick them up, put them in your hand. You know, most of the fragments are a little bit less than a centimeter in size, but um, they're very, uh, very easily obtained. Let's put it that way. So uh, many years ago, when I first started at Cortland, I thought it would be really interesting to test this hypothesis of 
whether or not water was, was, was what was responsible for making the garnet at Gore Mountain. So I thought that uh, my training is kind of in the area of fluid inclusions. And so uh, I thought it might be fun to look for some fluid inclusions inside of Gore Mountain Garnet to test this hypothesis. So um, I just grabbed a bunch of garnets from Gore Mountain uh, right here and from that number one pit that I showed you before. And I decided to just polish both sides of them. And so these are little garnet chips that I put a polish on the top side and on the bottom side so that I could look at them under a microscope. And, and this is what they, uh, the chips look like. These little uh, are samples that they're probably a millimeter thick, maybe a half a millimeter thick. And they're just little garnet windows um, so that we can put them under a microscope, put a light underneath them and look at them with a high power objective and see what's on the inside. So what I'd like to do is share with you uh, kind of the information or the the things that I found inside the garnets. And so I'm gonna focus uh, first on this sample GM2 in the next slide. So I'm gonna turn this sideways a little bit uh, and show you that the next image is gonna come from this part of the garnet right here. Uh, again, you can see this is about maybe three or four millimeters across uh, in this, uh, in this in, uh, image. And so let's take a closer look at what we can see inside the garnet. So this is what it looks like uh, inside the garnet. When you put a light underneath it and you look at it under the microscope, you see a bunch of different uh, inclusions on the inside of this garnet. And um, what kind of stands out to me right away are these long, thin inclusions that there's a parallel set that's kind of oriented horizontally, but then there's another set of these long inclusions oriented in this direction. And there's a third set that are kind of oriented in this in the direction as well. And so, as it turns out, these little thin inclusions turn, turn out to be the mineral rutile. And rutile is a titanium oxide. It's a pretty common mineral in garnet. But what it shows is that these little rutile inclusions are crystallographically controlled. That is that they're not controlled by fractures in the garnet or any other secondary process. These inclusions are controlled by the growth of the garnet itself. And so they formed at the same time uh, as the garnet. Okay, so that's one conclusion that we can make about, uh, uh, about these rutile inclusions. And so what I'd like to do is take a little closer look at the center of this and show you a, a second kind of set of inclusions. So here again, you see those same uh, acicular needle-like uh, rutile inclusions, um, but you also see these little tube-like inclusions down here that are not made out of rutile, but notice that they're in the same orientation, the same crystallographic orientation as the rutile. So here we've got an inclusion here that is parallel to that rutile needle. Here's an inclusion up here that's parallel to these sets of rutiles. Here's an inclusion over here that's parallel to this set of rutile inclusions as well. So these sort of tube-like or stubby kinds of inclusions are also crystallographically controlled. And so they formed at the same time as the garnet. So whatever inclusions those are, they were trapped and formed at the same time as the host garnet. So they're the same age as the garnet. And they tell us something about uh, how the garnet formed and, and, and some interpretations about the origin of the garnet. So what I'd like to do now is take a, a little closer look at this inclusion right here that's in focus um, and let you know a little bit more about it. So here's that same inclusion. Um, and you can see it's about 30 or 40 micrometers long. It's only about maybe 10, eight or 10 micrometers wide. So it's pretty tiny. It's taken with a high uh, magnification lens. And what you see on the inside here, this is all garnet that surrounds it. And on the inside, you see a bunch of these cracked kinds of minerals in here. And that cracked mineral that you see in the center turns out to be the mineral cristobalite. Um, and if you remember your mineralogy classes, cristobalite has the same chemical formula as quartz. Um, it's SiO2. And so this is a polymorph of silica. And the interesting thing about cristobalite um, is that it has a very low density. Uh, it's a very open structured silicate mineral. In fact, its density of uh, being 2.3 or so grams per cubic centimeter, this is the lowest density silicate mineral that occurs in nature. There isn't anything more with a more open structure and a silicate structure uh, than cristobalite. Okay. And also in this same uh, inclusion, we find a little opaque mineral, which turns out to be ilmenite. And then the rest of the inclusion is occupied um, by albite, uh, which you may remember again from your earlier geology classes. Uh, albite is, a, is basically the same thing as sodium plagioclase. So there's nothing uncommon about uh, the chemistry of these minerals. What's uncommon is that this cristobalite occurs inside of a garnet. And 
I might want to also tell you that this is the first occurrence of cristobalite in a, in a high pressure metamorphic rock anywhere uh, in the world. Um, and so it's really kind of a remarkable occurrence. Um, and it's also kind of funny too that you find a cracked mineral inside of a mineral that's not cracked. So you might be thinking, well, how, how the heck do you get those cracks or those fractures inside the cristobalite? Well, there's a story behind that uh, as well. But the dominant mineralogy is cristobalite, sodium plagioclase, uh, and a little bit of, of ilmenite. Okay, um, let me just say a couple things about those cracks in, uh, in cristobalite. Um, cristobalite has a, what we call an alpha form and a beta form, um, and they kind of look something like this. These are the structures of alpha cristobalite and beta cristobalite. Alpha cristobalite is tetragonal, but beta cristobalite is isometric. And I want to tell you that uh, when you change from alpha cristobalite to beta cristobalite, it's what we call a displacive transformation. In other words, you can change alpha cristobalite into beta cristobalite by just sort of tweaking the bond angles a little bit. You don't have to break any bonds to do it. All you have to do is kind of tweak the bond angles. It requires very little energy um, because you're not breaking any bonds and you can change it from alpha cristobalite to beta cristobalite. And so this displacive transformation in, in these two kinds of cristobalite occurs at a temperature range of about 265 to 270 uh, degrees Celsius. And you can go back and forth across that boundary very easily. Um, and so that's where that uh, transformation occurs. But there's something really interesting and, and rather uh, special about this transformation between alpha and beta cristobalite. And that is that there's a, a pretty big change of volume when you go from alpha cristobalite to beta cristobalite. It actually increases its volume by about 5%. Now, 5% might not seem like a lot, but 5% uh, in the mineral world is a huge volume change. And so that number is really huge. I don't know too many minerals that have a, a bigger delta V than, than 5%. So what that means is that when you heat up alpha cristobalite and it changes to beta cristobalate, its volume increases by 5%. But the opposite is true also. That is, if you take beta cristobalite and it starts off as beta cristobalite and you cool it down, to temperatures lower than 270 or so degrees Celsius, it contracts by 5%. And when it contracts, it actually cracks the structure by this contraction. And so it experiences, beta cristobalite experiences a 5% contraction on cooling. Uh, and so it actually cracks and it cracked inside of the garnets at Gore Mountain, which is really kind of, uh, kind of remarkable. So let me show you this. This is kind of interesting. So, um, so here's an image of a, of uh, one of these inclusions at Gore Mountain. This one's about maybe 30 or 40 uh, micrometers long. There are two crystals of cristobalite. There's this one right here. It's got a couple of cracks in it. Um, and then this one over here on the right has got a couple of cracks in it as well. So there's two crystals of cristobalite in this one inclusion, okay? And so what I'm gonna show you is a little video clip of this cristobalite going through this phase transformation from alpha cristobalite to beta cristobalite. Okay, and so here you see that same inclusion. This uh, video starts at 260 degrees Celsius. It's gonna end at about 271. And I'm gonna ask you to keep an eye on those fractures when we heat up this cristobalite. So you can see over a 10 degree centigrade range, all of those fractures in the cristobalite closed up. And if I cool it back off, all those same fractures just reopen again. And I can go back and forth across this transformation um, ad nauseum uh, for an infinite number of times, uh, and it'll keep going through this alpha beta transformation um, uh, in the cristobalite. So um, this phase behavior is kind of unique to cristobalite, and it's one of the first things that kind of gave it away that we were looking at cristobalite inside of these uh, garnets at Gore Mountain. So we published this uh, some years ago, back in 1997, and I'm just going to show you a couple of images of showing the alpha and beta cristobalite. These are more inclusions from Gore Mountain. This is all alpha cristobalite in the top, uh, beta cristobalite here in the bottom. Alpha cristobalite in the lower left, beta cristobalite over here in the lower right, with all the fractures closed up in just over, a, a, in this case, a 15 degree Celsius uh, range. I might also point out something interesting that I didn't met, really mention before, but notice the ratio of cristobalite to albite to ilmenite. 
you can see that the, the inclusion itself is kind of occupied by about maybe 60% cristoblite uh, and maybe 40% albite and a, you know, a couple percent of ilmenite. And that ratio is kind of the same everywhere we, uh, everywhere we see it. So here are a couple of other uh, inclusions. Um, again, from Gore Mountain. Uh, again, these are hosted by Garnet. And again, you can see the same phases, the opaque ilmenite, the cracked cristoblite, and the rest of it is filled in um, with, uh, with albite. But again, that same ratio of about 60% cristoblite, 40% um, albite. And so when we saw this occurrence of cristoblite and we recognized that the phase ratios of all these inclusions were pretty much the same, we inferred that whatever form these inclusions started off as something homogeneous. In order to keep that phase ratio constant, you have to keep, you have to have something that, that was kind of homogeneous to begin with. And so we inferred back in 1997 that these inclusions originated as tiny droplets of melt, little tiny droplets of magma inside the garnet that were trapped in the garnet as the garnet grew. And that later on, after the garnet formed, those melts experienced crystallization. And they basically crystallized to make uh, cristoblite, albite, and ilmenite. And so that was our interpretation back uh, in the 1990s. And uh, as I'll show a little bit later on, uh, this work was, uh, has been confirmed by, with, uh, with uh, my colleagues from uh, Europe as well. So I just wanna throw that out there that we inferred uh, these as melt inclusions uh, many years ago. So the melt forming reaction that we proposed was something like this. You basically take the minerals of a, of a gabbro, pyroxene, olivine, and plagioclase, and you add water to it. Uh, you make garnet and then a pargosite, which is a kind of horn blend, uh, and a little bit of this hydrous melt. So if I can simplify this a little bit more, you basically take a gabbro plus water, uh, makes a garnet amphibolite, and a little bit of this uh, melt phase um, is left over as well. And that melt phase that's left over, if it's dominated by cristoblite and albite, that melt has to be rich in sodium, aluminum, and silica uh, in order to make these kinds of uh, melt inclusions in the, in the garnet at Gore Mountain. Okay, so let's think about this kind of melt if it's got those minerals in it. So what kind of melt is formed? Well, uh, again, you may remember this diagram. Um, that shows uh, how granitic rocks are classified. This is the QAP diagram that basically looks at the relative percentages of quartz uh, and alkali feldspar or K feldspar, that's what the A stands for, and, and P for plagioclase. And so these rocks don't have any K feldspar in them, or these little inclusions don't have any K feldspar. So there's very little potassium in this rock or in these inclusions. Uh, and so if you have to plot it somewhere in this diagram, it's probably gonna plot over here kind of in the tonalite uh, area of this diagram. And so if we have to describe what kind of an igneous rock these melts would make, it would have to be a tonalite uh, because they're dominated by sodium plagioclase and quartz and very little, uh, if any, uh, K feldspar. Okay, so these are trap samples of tonalite melt inside of the garnet uh, at Gore Mountain. Okay, let me just switch gears for a second and then we'll uh, get back to the uh, inclusions at Gore Mountain. Um, you might be wondering how is it that we study and identify these really tiny minerals inside of a garnet? Well, we use two instruments for that. We normally use a laser Raman a spectrometer. That's the first instrument we use. And it's really an interesting instrument. What we do is we take a laser and we fire it down the objective of a microscope and it'll take a laser beam that's a couple of millimeters in diameter and it'll shrink it down to a couple of microns. Um, because after all, it's laser light, it behaves just like regular light. So it takes something big and shrinks it down to something small. And so we fire that laser, and we aim that laser on these minerals that we want to identify. Uh, and if there are any covalent bonds in that mineral, those covalent bonds will cause the laser light to experience Raman scattering. We'll get some Raman scattering from uh, that laser interaction with the covalent bonds, and it'll tell us exactly kind of what mineral is present. It's, it's kind of like a little, a little uh, microscopic X-ray diffractometer. Uh, every mineral has its own Raman spectrum. And so we can just point the laser at a mineral, press a few buttons and compare it to a database uh, these days uh, and identify exactly what mineral it is. Um, the other instrument that we use is an electron microprobe. 
Um, and this gives us very precise information about the chemistry of the minerals that we're studying. So we basically take, it's, it's like a scanning electron microscope. We fire a beam of electrons into our mineral based on the behavior of those electrons. When they come out of the mineral, we can identify what elements are present inside of the mineral. So the electron microprobe gives us the chemistry of the minerals. The laser Raman spectrometer tells us exactly what the structure of that mineral is like. So these are the instruments that we use to, to identify and study really tiny minerals um, inside, of, uh, inside of other minerals, I guess. Okay, um, so I just wanna share with you a Raman spectra that we collected uh, back in the late 90s. Uh, we also published this uh, at the same time, but this is the Raman spectra of Cristoblite at, at Core Mountain. Uh, nowadays, we would collect the Raman spectra, compare it to a database and identify it as Cristoblite. But in those days, the database wasn't that uh, well filled out, let's put it that way. And so we would have to provide another piece of natural Cristoblite or a piece of synthetic Cristoblite to compare our unknown to, to kind of prove to people that, uh, that we had Cristoblite in these rocks. So this is just a Raman spectra uh, of here. And what we do is we measure these wave numbers. This is the Raman spectra. It's the, the, it's the amount of wavelengths that it's, or wave numbers um, that it's uh, displaced, I suppose, from the, uh, uh, from the laser, the wavelength of the laser. Okay, so, um, okay, so uh, why would Cristoblite be in these Adirondack rocks? Um, this is a, a phase diagram of the silica system showing all the different polymorphs of silica. We're probably most familiar with alpha quartz and beta quartz, but the cristobalite stability field occurs at very, very high temperatures. The only place where cristobalite is, is, we think is thermodynamically stable is between about 1,470 degrees Celsius and 1,705 degrees Celsius. And these temperatures are not exactly commonly realized uh, really in any uh, rocks near the surface of the earth. Um, and so uh, the Adirondack, um, PT conditions of metamorphism are far lower than that. Um, they're around 800 or so degrees, cel uh, degrees Celsius, 850 degrees Celsius, and maybe about 0.8 gigapascals, uh, not really a very high pressure um, compared to, let's say, the pressure uh, that you would need to make coasite or stishovite. Um, but the only place that I know of where cristobalite forms within its stability field, or more, I should say the only common place is where lightning strikes, uh, let's say a beach sand. So if you were to go to Jones Beach or Robert Moses Beach, and if lightning were to strike there, you might make a little fulgurite in that sand. And a lot of that's gonna be composed of silica glass, but you might find some little cristobalite crystals on the inside of that as well, because that's the only place where you're gonna get that high temperatures that close to the surface of the earth. So um, we know that the cristobalite did not form in its stability field for cristobalite. We know it formed at a, at a temperature much lower than that. And so it formed outside of its stability field. And so we sort of say or infer that the cristobalite formed metastably. Okay, so any mineral that forms metastably, it forms in these rocks, but it forms outside of its stability field. So we re refer to that as a metastable crystallization of cristobalite. And we're not 100% sure why this happens. Um, it may be due to uh, sort of rapid cooling of these melt inclusions. Uh, it may have something to do with the fact that it's growing inside of a tiny little cavity inside of garnet. Uh, you know, there's some rules that apply to tiny things that don't apply to, to, to megascopic things. So we're not 100% sure of why cristobalite forms inside of these inclusions, but we just know that it forms metastably outside of its stability field. So we, we'll, I'll refer to this metastable growth of cristobalite um, uh, in a number of times uh, going forward. So what have we learned since 1997? Uh, where have we found cristobalite uh, in other parts of the world? Well, cristobalite since 1997 has also been found in a couple of other uh, crystallized melt inclusion studies around the world. And so there was a, a study published in 2006 that describes some cristobalite and some melt inclusions that occurred over in Kazakhstan uh, in Asia. Um, there was a study uh, that was published in 2016 uh, by my colleague, Silvio Ferraro. Uh, he recognized some cristobalite and some melt inclusions uh, along with a couple of other uh, odd minerals that we'll talk about in just a second. But he was describing these melt inclusions inside of garnet from the Bohemian Massif uh, over in Europe. Um, and so I, I like to show Silvio's picture because uh, Silvio is kind of a specialist in these, these nano granites. Uh, they've mostly been finding these nano granites. Let me point out this word here in the title of their, 
uh, their paper, uh, they've been looking at tiny little droplets of granite uh, preserved inside of garnet. Uh, and of course, these minerals occur in there and, and uh, in, inside of the garnets. And uh, Silvio has been one of those uh, scientists over in uh, Europe studying these for, uh, for quite a number of years. It's kind of his specialty. So we'll talk more about that in just a second. But let me just go back to his title. Um, you'll notice these two other minerals that occur in the title along with Cristobalite. Um, these are minerals um, that are called Kochetovite um, and uh, Kundikolite. Uh, and these minerals occur in these nanogranites. So these are uh, images of these tiny little inclusions of nanogranites um, inside of garnet from the Bohemian Massif. Okay. Um, so again, this Kochetovite and uh, Kundikolite um, are a kind of unusual minerals. Uh, this first one, uh, Kundikolite is a disordered polymorph of albite. Isn't that interesting? So it's basically the same thing as sodium plagioclase, uh, but uh, it's sort of a disordered kind of structure. Uh, and it's actually orthorhombic um, in its mineral structure. It's not triclinic like most uh, albite is. Uh, and this other uh, polymorph, Kochetovite, uh, is actually a disordered polymorph of K-feldspar. So again, it's got the chemistry of a granite, but it's not K-feldspar and plagioclase and quartz. It's, uh, it's kumdikolite and it's uh, kokchetovite and it's cristoblite instead, these disordered polymorphs of these minerals. So we're gonna talk more about these as well. And this is, this is why uh, Silvio was very interested uh, in uh, studying these rocks at uh, Gore Mountain. So what I'd like to do is now is share with you some of the work that, uh, that I've done uh, with my colleagues in Europe, but I'm gonna give them the, the credit because they're the ones that have uh, really made a lot of progress uh, on trying to understand these inclusions a little bit better at Gore Mountain. So here's our, our team of scientists. So um, uh, Silvio Ferraro uh, is kind of the lead scientist on this. And these are uh, two of his uh, PhD students, uh, Iris uh, Von Hoff and Alicia Borghini. Uh, Alicia is like uh, Silvio, is, uh, they're both from Italy uh, and Iris is, uh, is from Germany. Um, and so uh, uh, it, uh, as I say, uh, Silvio got interested in these inclusions at Gore Mountain, came over in uh, 2018, and for the last couple of years we've been studying these inclusions and we're just really starting to publish some of the results of them as well. And, but I want to give them the credit. Those, those, those guys have really been going uh, crazy on trying to understand these inclusions. I want to share with you what they have found so far. So one of the first things that, that uh, I did with Silvio is I sent him a couple of samples so he could put on the Raman spectrometer. Uh, and so this is the first sample that I sent him. And you can see that a very familiar inclusion with its cracked cristobalite uh, and the albite uh, and the rutil and a, and a little bit of ilmenite uh, as well. And when I sent it over to him, he put the Raman spectrometer on him. And the first thing that he found was that this is not albite. <laughs> okay, so um, it actually turns out to be this um, kumdikolite Again, uh, this is a mineral that is kind of new to science. We'll talk about it in a second, but it turns out that this stuff uh, is not actually albite. It has the same chemistry of the albite, but it's a little bit different crystal structure. So it's one of these metastable polymorphs of sodium plagioclase. Uh, and it's again, it's fairly new to science, uh, uh, as we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so this is the Raman spectrum of kumdikolite. Uh, you can see some of these peaks here that are pretty characteristic of kumdikolite. And so uh, we are uh, literally 100% sure that this is kumdikolite, um, the metastable polymorph of sodium plagioclase. So I sent him another sample like this, uh, all this material uh, in this very long uh, tube-like inclusion. I didn't know what it was, but clearly it looks like there's a bunch of different grains in there. And so I thought this might've been a little tonalite melt in there as well. I didn't know what it was. Uh, so I asked him to analyze it. And sure enough, it's full of, of quartz and kumdikolite. Uh, as well. Uh, there's a little bit of phlogopite or biotite in there, some more uh, kumdikolite over there um, as well on the right-hand side. And again, our ilmenite was confirmed from before. And so these inclusions uh, don't have albite in them. Uh, at least most of them don't have albite. Um, they have this uh, kumdikolite instead. Let me just say a couple of things about kumdikolite. Again, it's got the same formula as albite because it's a polymorph, but it's orthorhombic. It's not triclinic. The aluminum and the silicon are very disordered, just like high albite amongst the fourfold sites. Um, it was first reported in 2009. 
So we didn't even know about cum decolite back in 1997. So it was first reported in 2009. Um, it was reported in the European Journal of Mineralogy. And it's uh, been interpreted, um, this is a, a quote from a paper in, in 2011, that cum decolite is presumed to be a metastable phase formed at high temperatures, followed by rapid cooling in the absence of water. And so this is kind of the, the interpretation of what cum decolite is when you find it inside of rocks. Not very common. Um, and so uh, again, this is sort of uh, what we think uh, is taking, or what we think is going on uh, inside of uh, Gore Mountain. I might want to also point out that uh, even though cum decolite has only been around for you know, 10 or 12 years, uh, this is the occurrence at Gore Mountain is the first occurrence of cum decolite in North America. And I wanted to share that with you. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, it was found, as I mentioned, by Silvio uh, Ferraro in the Bohemian Massif. Uh, again, same kind of origin in melt inclusions inside of Gar. So the, the long and short of it is that, uh, that both cristobalite and cum decolite um, are pretty typical for melt inclusions. That's what we're finding both at Gore Mountain and also the Bohemian Massif and other places in Asia uh, as well. So to kind of summarize the, the phases that you have here, um, so if, if our formula is SiO2, the, the stable phase would be quartz. Uh, if it's uh, NaAlSi308, we would find sodium plagioclase, but instead in the inclusions, we find cristobalite and cum decolite. Okay, so if you're gonna make a really tiny tonalite, you're gonna to make it out of cristobalite and cum decolite. If it's gonna erupt onto the surface or intrude into rocks, it's gonna make quartz and sodium plagioclase. So let me just uh, summarize the other important findings of what uh, Silvio and his students have found. So again, here's a, a typical sample of Gore Mountain Garnet. Here are the same kinds of inclusions that we looked at before. Um, but what Silvio was able to do is study these under the electron microprobe and found a, a bunch of really interesting textures and minerals inside of these, uh, inside of these inclusions in garnet. So let me start over here on the left. Uh, here's a, uh, an inclusion inside of garnet. Um, it has a negative crystal shape. So these are actually crystal faces on the inside of garnet. Garnets can have crystal faces on the outside, but if you have a fluid or a liquid on the inside, they'll develop crystal faces on the inside. We call these negative crystals. And so here's a negative crystal right here. And the two dominant minerals are quartz and cum decolite, um, just like we were talking about before. Another similar example, there's, there's a couple of other minerals, uh, anthophyllite, that's a kind of an amphibole. There's some apatite in there as well. Um, they're kind of minor phases. Here's another inclusion, again, quartz and cum decolite. Um, and then this uh, third example, again, this one has cristobalite and cum decolite as well as ilmenite in the top. Uh, but these are, these are very interesting textures that you see in the minerals. And, and if you look carefully, especially at these last two images, you'll find that these crystals of cristobalite and cum decolite are really tiny. They're tiny, tiny little crystals. In fact, if you look at the scale on, on this image on the right, that, that's two microns. And so these crystals are smaller than a micron, okay? And so these are not microscopic minerals, they are nanoscopic minerals. And so instead of being a, a tonalite, like a microscopic tonalite, it's actually a nanotonalite inside of Gore Mountain Garden. And this texture is very characteristic of an igneous origin. So that's consistent with our interpretation of the melt inclusion um, hypothesis. Okay, so these are actually nanotonalite melt inclusions. So they're nanoscopic scale. Really, I've never seen a nanoscopic mineral in, 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 I've looked at Adirondack rocks for 30 something years and I've never seen anything that's of igneous origin on the nanoscopic scale, but yet they're present right, uh, present right here, really tiny minerals. So let me just share with you a couple other uh, bits of information starting from left to right. Um, these are the Raman spectra of the cristobalite, like we talked about before. Uh, here's the uh, cum decolite over here as well. We've confirmed that by Raman spectroscopy. Again, there's a little bit of pargasite. That's the, the amphibole, very much like hornblende. Another amphibole called anthophyllite that we find in there as well. Uh, we're still studying those at this point. Um, but what's even more interesting and more significant is what you see in this image in the upper right. This is a melt inclusion that never crystallized inside the garnet. And so instead of having cristobalite and cum decolite, it actually has primary preserved glass in it. This is Precambrian glass 
inside of a so-called metamorphic garnet in, in the Adirondacks that never crystallized. So we find glass inclusions inside of, of igneous minerals, like, um, like if you went to Hawaii and you saw little olivine um, phenocrysts that erupted in a lava flow, you might look inside those olivines and see little droplets of glass inside of those olivines. So we find glass inclusions inside of volcanic rocks, um, but these are glass, in, glass inclusions inside of, of essentially igneous minerals that formed at um, 30 kilometers below the surface. And so this is the first occurrence of glass, primary glass anywhere in the Adirondacks um, and certainly any, in any metamorphic rock um, in North America. Uh, it also occurs with some of this uh, pargasite as well, um, but the glass itself, is, we only found one inclusion. We don't find a lot of it, um, but the fact that there's glass here is, is the, probably the strongest evidence that these inclusions started off as melt inclusions. There's really no other interpretation that's, that's reasonable at this point. Uh, believe it or not, glass has a Raman spectrum. Uh, th this is these little peaks that are shown here uh, with the brown asterisks. Those are actually Raman spectra of glass. It has a little bit of short range ordering that uh, can show up in the Raman spectrum. Uh, it's not as disordered as we, as we like to think, um, but we can prove that this is glass uh, by looking at the Raman spectrum as well. So this is really interesting. And again, confirms our hypothesis that these things started off as melts. So what Silvio likes to do um, uh, when he finds melt inclusions that are crystallized or crystallizes, he tries to re-homogenize them by heating them up and trying to melt them again. Uh, and so what Silvio and his students have done is taken these uh, crystallized melt inclusions and put them inside of a piston cylinder apparatus that you see here on the right. And basically what you do is you, you sort of squeeze these samples together and you reheat them to really high temperature. Uh, and then you look at the sample again when you take it out to see if that inclusion over here has melted. And if it has melted, then that kind of confirms that it formed as an igneous or an igneous origin, it tells you uh, the temperature that it rehomogenized, which is important. But most importantly, if you can rehomogenize the inclusion and get it to melt again, you're basically making a glass again. And you can analyze that glass and determine the composition of that magma. And that's really significant. And that's exactly what uh, my, my colleague Silvio uh, has done. And so I'm gonna share with you some of his results. Uh, these are experimental runs uh, that showed uh, the rehomogenization that occurred at a pretty high temperature, a little bit higher than about 100 degrees higher than the, the peak metamorphic conditions. So at temperatures of around 940 degrees Celsius, um, Silvio was able to get the uh, inclusions to, uh, to remelt um, and rehomogenize. At temperatures below that, they, they didn't do that. And so we think that these homogenization temperatures do actually record a higher temperature uh, formation of the garnet than what we think of uh, with that normal 800 or 850 degrees Celsius. So there is some evidence that may, they may have formed at a little bit higher temperature. Um, but uh, I do want to show you again, this is what one of the inclusions looked like. It's now been converted to a glass at 940 degrees Celsius. Uh, and these are the Raman bands associated with uh, that glass. But there's also, I want to point out that some of that glass has a little bit of water in it, which is kind of important. So these little uh, OH bands that we find at the far end of the Raman spectrum are pretty typical of, of, of a glass that has a little bit of water uh, in it. And so these are, are rehomogenized inclusions. We're going to get the composition of those inclusions, but it also has glass or has water in that glass as well. Not a lot, but a, but a little bit of water as well. So let me share with you the compositional data um, from uh, these melt inclusions and why they're significant. Okay. So what you see here is a couple of uh, uh, igneous variation diagrams that has a whole bunch of data. So let me, let me point out the important ones. Um, these open circles that you see in each of the diagrams, these are seven samples that uh, Silvio and his students analyzed. Uh, and these uh, are the compositions of those rehomogenized inclusions. This dark uh, filled in blue circle is the one inclusion that uh, we found preserved inside of the garnet. So that's the data that, that, that we're contributing. The, the dark circle is the gabbro composition, the gabbro protolith. So uh, we're not, we won't talk about that for now. But all of the other data that you see in here comes from experimental studies 
on melting mafic rocks in the presence of water. So these are all come from experiments in the literature where those scientists were trying to make synthetic melts out of mafic rocks in the presence of water. And so how do the glass inclusions at Gore Mountain compare to experimental melts? You have to forgive me, I got a plane flying over right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. We don't get very many jets or planes here in Cortland, but once in a while we do. So anyway, you can see that this data spans the literature of experimental melts, and you can see that the glass compositions at Gore Mountain agree um, pretty similarly, I would say, with some of these, these experimental melts on mafic rocks in the presence of water. And so we were really excited about this uh, because uh, we believe that they form from mafic rocks, but this really kind of proves that not only are they igneous in origin, but they, they definitely form from the gabbro host rock uh, that we find at Gore Mountain. The other thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is that um, these inclusions down here in this bottom variation diagram, they actually plot not necessarily in the tonalite stability field, but they actually plot in the trongemite stability field. And trongemites and tonalites are, are similar, um, but they're actually sort of plotting in the trongemite stability field rather than the tonalite. Tonalites are a little bit more calcium rich. Um, so let me just uh, share with you a little bit of information about trongemites. Uh, trongemite, it's just basically a variety of tonalite. It's a plagioclase quartz bearing rock, but the plagioclase is pretty sodic, okay? So the abundance of calcium in the plagioclase is anywhere from 10 to 30%. Tonalites have a little bit more calcium than that. So trongemites are, are just sort of sodic uh, tonalites, okay? And it's, this is important because these trongemitic melts that occur at Gore Mountain, um, they're important because along with tonalite and granodiorite, these are the three main rocks that make up the oldest continental crust on Earth. Okay, the earliest continents were made up of tonalite, trongemite, and granodiorite. In fact, uh, amongst people that study these old pieces of continental crust, these are or continental crust, excuse me, these are known as TTGs or tonalite, trongemite, uh, granodiorite rocks. Okay, and so this is what made up the earliest continents um, uh, on our on our planet, and we're finding evidence of those kinds of melts in. Uh, inside the Garnet at Gore Mountain. So I just want to show you a couple of pictures of some TTG rocks. Um, this is a couple of images uh, from the South China Craton, which is about 3 billion years old, and the rocks are dominated by quartz and plagioclase. Okay, they're tonalites, trongemites, granodiorites. Uh, this is an image of a, a rock sample from the Katval Craton in, in South Africa. And again, the light color minerals in here are plagioclase and quartz. The dark colored stuff is mostly hornblende, um, very similar kinds of, of mineralogy. And so this is the stuff that basically made the earliest uh, continental crust on earth. And it was made by, uh, by partially melting mafic rocks on earth. And so how do you make a continent when all of the stuff on earth is mafic? Well, you have to partially melt it in the presence of water and you make these TTG rocks. So I just want to, uh, as I'm getting towards the end, I want to show you what, what the Earth looks like in the present day, kind of on the right. But this is probably what the Earth looked like uh, back in the Archean. Um, and it's not an exaggeration. These were probably the first proto-continents that formed uh, in the Archean. And the world's oceans were full of, of uh, ferrous iron. And ferrous iron uh, and high concentrations turns water kind of green. So back in the Archean, the oceans might not have been blue, they might have been green. Uh, but the earliest continents were made out of this uh, TTG uh, suite of rocks, uh, the same kinds of melts that we find inside of Gore Mountain. So uh, again, I just want to kind of summarize here the same inclusions that we find at Gore Mountain. Uh, again, we find these, um, these nanotrongemites uh, again, that prove that these, these textures prove that that's an igneous origin. We find glass in there again. So we pretty much confirmed uh, that these are melt, uh, uh, melting in origin, uh, but we call these things nanotrongemites uh, at Gore Mountain. I might want to also point out that um, all of the prior melt inclusion studies that we've known about in the last 20 years, they all describe nanogranites. 
Okay, most uh, uh, melt inclusion studies that are done in phases like garnet and pyroxene and other things, they're almost always nanogranites. But these at Gore Mountain, um, these are the first uh, described uh, essentially TTG melt inclusions uh, that occur in nature. Um, so they're really kind of interesting. They're the first nanotrangemites. All the rest of the studies uh, are pretty much uh, nanogranites. So um, just to kind of summarize, I want to let you know that we're kind of excited about this because um, we uh, literally 10 days ago, we found out that the paper that summarizes all this uh, uh, information um, is going to be published by uh, EPSL. Um, and the title of the talk is going to be uh, Embryos of TTGs in Gore Mountain Garnet um, uh, Megacris from Water Flux uh, Melting in the Lower Crust. And so uh, this is going to come out sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, we're pretty excited about it but it's, because it summarizes all of the fine work uh, that Silvio and Iris and uh, Alicia and some other, uh, we have some other authors on this as well. It's not just the four of us um, uh, that have contributed to this work. So we're pretty excited about that. So let me summarize a couple of important points and then we'll kind of finish things up. So uh, the Barton Mine Garnet uh, formed when water was injected along the fault, but the water caused melting of the gabbro. So the biggest garnets in the world grew in the presence of melt, not water. The water was the thing that started everything, but it, the garnets, there's no evidence that the garnets uh, grew in the presence of, uh, of H2O. Um, the trongemite composition of the melts uh, is very similar to the kind of melts that's produced by experimental, experimental melting of mafic rocks in the presence of water. So we're very excited about finding these uh, natural samples of partial melts uh, inside of uh, these garnets at Gore Mountain. And lastly, the melt process that occurred at Gore Mountain uh, may be the same process that created the earliest continents on Earth, which is kind of exciting. This is, you know, controversial. We're not saying this is the only process. There, there may be other, or a lot of other interpretations about how the earliest continents formed. Um, but this is one process that we may see evidence for in the garnets um, at Gore Mountain. And the last thing that I want to leave you with is uh, an image of my co-author, uh, Iris von Ha, and she's standing in front of this big slab of Gore Mountain Garnet that was cut, um, I think in 2017 or 2016 for the American Museum of Natural History, um, closer to you guys than it is to me. But this slab of rock was cut from Gore Mountain and this is what's remaining. It's this perfectly flat slab cutting right through the centers of garnets. Uh, it's just one of the most remarkable uh, outcrops, I, I guess, I've ever seen, uh, 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 ever, I guess. Um, and so it was really exciting to be able to visit this and uh, be able to share this with my colleagues, uh, Iris and Alicia and Silvio. So uh, that's all I have to say. And so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Bob. That was really interesting. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I, thank I enjoyed you. it. Let me stop, yes, thank let me stop you. sharing this. And Bob, I want to say that, uh, after hearing you talk again, I'm proud that I was in your first petrology class ever taught. That's right. Uh, I'm proud to have <laughs> and you. I, and, I'm, and I can honestly say that I would never pass the geology test today. <laughs> 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 Nothing to do with you. It's just that they haven't done well. that kind of geology in a long time. That yeah. was really interesting, and it brought back a lot of memories. I really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'd be very happy to answer any questions if anybody has any questions about the garnets or anything up at Gore Mountain. Dr. Darling? Yes. So the formation of the, the uh, trondolite, that had to do with a process that was more common during the Archean, and this just happened to be a vestige of that process in the Proterozoic? Yeah, that's exactly right. That was a good summary. Um, yeah, we think that in the Archean, um, the, the surface of the earth was mostly uh, mafic rocks uh, because the continental crust hadn't formed yet. And so how do you, how do you begin to form a continent? Well, you, we, know that there, we do know that there was liquid water on the surface of the earth very early on. Uh, there are a lot of studies that have confirmed that. Um, but we also know that the surface of the earth was composed of, you know, sort of basaltic rocks or mafic rocks. And so if you can cause partial melting to occur in the presence of water, one of the very first melts that you make is one of these trongemites. And so we think that the earliest melts of the mafic crust may have produced some of these trongemites and tonalites 
uh, and granite diorites that may have sort of coalesced together to form the very first continents on Earth. So that yeah, you're absolutely right. This is a process, and I'm glad you pointed this out. What we're seeing at Gore Mountain did not occur during the Archean. This occurred during the Proterozoic, but it's just it's a re, it's a reflection of what we think that process was during the Archean. So that was a very nice summary. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And then also the crystal bill. I I, I remember there used to be a, I had uh, my rock samples was obsidian with crystal bayolite in it, what they yeah. call the snowflake obsidian? Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, so snowflake obsidian is mostly volcanic glass. And of course the obsidian is the dark part, but every once in a while you'll see this variety of obsidian called snowflake obsidian. And the little snowflakes, as it turns out, they're mostly cristobalite crystals. So oh. those are cristobalite crystals that are trying to crystallize from that glass. So what happens in that obsidian is that it erupts from a rhyolite volcano and it, it, it's cooled off very quickly. And so it, it really, it, it gets kind of quenched, but as it's cooling off, it still remains kind of hot. And in some places, the, the disordered glass tries to order itself. And when it tries to order itself, the first mineral that it makes is crystobalite. Oh. And so it starts to grow inside the obsidian, but then the heat is taken away and the crystallization process of crystobalite stops. And so you have all these little snowflakes of crystobalite that are kind of caught in the act of crystallizing. And so that's the origin of snowflake obsidian. All right, thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Uh, I'm, I'm confused about something. You said that the garnets um, grew in the presence of melt, but not water but they also, uh, they're in a, an amphibolite, and you said amphibole hornblend has to grow in the presence of water. That's right. I'm confused. Yeah. Okay, no, no, thank you for pointing that out. The, um, <laughs> the, amphibole, or the, the amphibole that occurs at Gore Mountain, it, it, it could have one of two origins. It could have grown in the presence of water, like is widely uh, hypothesized, or it could also grow in the presence of water-rich melt as well. So okay. horn blend in a like a in an andesite or a diorite that grows in the presence of a water rich melt. So the horn blend can grow um, in the presence of either liquid water or the presence of water rich melt. Now, I would like to say that the horn blend at Gore Mountain grew in the presence of this melt as well, but we have not looked for melt inclusions in the horn blend. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is, uh, I mean, I've looked at horn blend. I haven't looked very hard. Part of the reason is we don't think that those melt inclusions could be preserved in horn blend because horn blend has two cleavages. It's not a strong mineral. Uh, garnet has no cleavage. And so any melt inclusion that forms in a, in a garnet has a much better chance of being preserved in the garnet than it does uh, in, a, in a horn blend. So even if we looked hard for melt inclusions uh, in the horn blend, we might find some, uh, but the chances are uh, horn blend is just not a really good phase for looking for melt inclusion. So I don't, I don't know if that, that answers your question, but I think it could have either origin. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Hey, Bob, can I go off on a little bit of a tangent here? Of course. Um, you wouldn't expect anything less, would you? No, of course. We got started off on a bad tangent, right? <laughs> um, back back when, I, when I was in your class in the 90s, you had once made the statement that we don't know why the Adirondacks are there. Is that still true? Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of still true. Um, we know that... Uh, we know that well, here's what we know about the Adirondacks. We know that there's a dome-like structure to the Adirondacks, but we don't know when the dome formed, okay? okay. What we do know is that uh, if you look at Mary Roden's data, she looked at apatite fission tracks in the Adirondacks, and so did uh, 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 Paul Fitzgerald from Syracuse University. Um, we know that based on their two studies, we know that the rocks in the Adirondacks came up through the 100 degree Celsius isotherm um, during the Cretaceous. So we know that the rocks in the Adirondacks were moving upward through, you know, when the thermometer was at 100 degrees Celsius, we know that those rocks moved up through that 100 degree thermometer in the Cretaceous. And they have not been heated up past 100 degrees since about 190 million years ago. Hmm. So, so we know that that's a fact that we know about the Adirondacks. So 
did the dome form at the same time as those rocks were being uplifted or did the dome form earlier and they the whole dome came up during the Cretaceous? Those are the two biggest unanswered questions that we have about the Adirondacks. So I get, if, that, if that answers your question, Tom, that's what we know and that's what we don't know. That does answer my question. Thank you, Rob. Sure. I have one more question, if that's okay. Of course. <laughs> In one of the earlier photos you showed, you showed the garnets uh, surrounded by rims of, of sort of coarser grained horn blend. Right. Um, can you explain how that happens? I'm really interested in these sort of reaction rims. I've collected a lot of Adirondack rocks and I see some very interesting uh, reaction rims around uh, not just garnet, but around uh, like grains of, I think, ilmenite and, and things like that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of those, what we call coronal textures, uh, reaction rims and a lot of Adirondack minerals. You're absolutely right. Um, the, the hornblende rims at Gore Mountain have been, uh, I guess, widely interpreted. It's probably one of the biggest um, unanswered questions uh, that uh, we have at Gore Mountain. Everybody talks about, you know, those rims are metamorphic reaction rims that formed on the retrograde path. Other people say, no, that those are primary features. They're related to the growth of the garnet. Um, and I, I kind of lean towards the, the latter, that is that they're related to the growth of the garnet. The way I view them um, in, in our interpretation is that um, those horn blend rims are really um, better viewed as plagioclase depletion zones. So we know that pargasite is produced by that melt forming reaction, but we know that um, plagioclase is consumed by that reaction. And so as the garnet grows, it consumes plagioclase. It does make pargasite. And so those rims might reflect just plagioclase depletion zones as garnet is growing. So that, that's kind of our interpretation. I don't think we ever, ever actually published that anywhere, but that's kind of uh, the, the going idea that most people view today with those horn blend reactions rims is that they're just plagioclase depletion zones. Okay. That's, that's the Thanks. best answer I can give you. I, I, wish right. I, I wish I could go through the whole history of why people think it's one or the other, but um, that's kind of the current thinking about it. Uh, but uh, no one has ever really modeled it before. It'd be fun to kind of model it to see if there's this relationship between the, the, the rim size and uh, the garnet size and the abundance of plagioclase or hornblende and the rest of the rock. It'd be fun to kind of model that, but uh, none of us have ever done that. There's still a lot of unanswered questions at Gore Mountain. That's great. Thank, well, thank you. you. And yeah, thank really, you. Enjoy, really enjoy your talk. Well, thank you very much. I, I enjoy getting it. <laughs> I had a quick question for you also, uh, sure. Robert. Fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, from a, a perspective of mineral resources, how unique is the Barton mine globally? Um, well, uh, the only thing that's really unique about it is the, the size of the garnets and the, uh, um, they're, they're not particularly abundant there. Um, uh, if, if you look at the average abundance, I think it's around 13 uh, mole percent uh, garnet. Um, you find that same kind of abundance, a little less abundant at the Hooper mine. It's also about the same abundance that we find at uh, Ruby Mountain. Um, and in those mines, uh, uh, there's really, um, as I say, there, there's, there's, those are about the richest garnet deposits that we know of in situ. Those are not plaster deposits, as, as I'm sure you're aware of. There are plaster deposits in Australia that have a higher garnet abundance. Um, and of course, they're already crushed up, so it's a little bit easier to process those. Um, but uh, Barton, I think, um, I don't think it was particularly concentrated at Bar Barton. They were just big garnets uh, and they were uh, readily available. And I think that they focused on those garnets in the early part of the 20th century and the latter part of the 19th century. Um, but I don't think there's, I, the only thing that's really unique about Gore Mountain is that the garnets are huge. That's about the only thing that I can say. Okay. Yeah, it's well, a good thanks. I, I still have my, my, I think I took my, the NYSGA field trip with you and oh, thank is you. That right? so, that anybody was it. Has, so anybody has a chance to go to the mart to the mine please do uh, was that in 2008 thing, do you remember was that perhaps, in 2008? perhaps so yeah, right. yeah well I, uh, i'm glad that you went on that i just want to say one other thing about that that 2008 trip we went to both barton uh, bill kelly and i went to both barton and we went up to tahawas and looked at the iron ores up there and we had 109 participants on that trip <laughs> And Alan Benamoff can correct me, but 
but I think that was the largest NYI, NYSGA trip ever in recorded history. Yep. So you were part of that. I think I'm pretty sure. Yeah, <laughs> I think you were the leader of that one. Uh, the other thing is back in the uh, Paleozoic when I went to field camp uh, at uh, Cortland, uh, they had the uh, Brower field camp. I'm not sure if that's still in existence or not. Well, thanks but, for mentioning that. Yes. But they had a beautiful fireplace that was made from these rocks, and uh, it was just fascinating. <laughs> well, uh, well, Brower Field Station, it, we are still running uh, Brower Field Station. Uh, we, we didn't run it this year, and we didn't run it last summer because of COVID uh, restrictions, but we ran it the summer uh, before then. And okay. uh, I and my colleagues still teach uh, field camp there. Uh, I teach in the fourth week. I take my students up to the Saratoga area. Uh, we study metamorphic rocks up there. Um, but uh, what, what year were, did you go to Browerfield? <laughs> uh, this was back in 1982. And then I was uh, an instructor there too a couple of years later after oh. that, uh, you know, as a graduate student. So it's a, a fantastic place. I'm, well, glad it's, I'm glad it's still in, in existence and yeah. it's still being run. Well, thank you. We uh, we do thank still you. run it. It's uh, it is it, nowadays. It's pretty well endowed. Um, we offer uh, field summer field camp for our students at Cortland, but we also accept students from other universities. Uh, we often have some scholarship money for students that want to go for the full uh, five or six weeks of field camp. Um, and so, uh, as far as I know, the only thing that's holding us back from running Brower is uh, is the pandemic for the last year and a half. Excellent. I'm oh, glad. Yeah. So, and you were in, in 1982. You were in either the first or second class. I, I think I, I think I was the first. Yeah, we were yeah. the first group yeah. with John Fouth, who was the uh, the leader at that point. And yeah. I, I guess he's passed away at that point. Yeah. Well, so. Uh, yeah. So John doesn't teach there anymore. Um, John yeah. is retired from Cortland, uh, okay. but uh, uh, but he doesn't teach there anymore. And and he was the one to get the NSF grant to get that started. And so it really yes. and it's that. Brower Field Station is is John Faust, John Faust's baby. <laughs> yes, excellent. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Thank uh, you. It was great. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we also have a question from the chat from David Harper. Oh, uh, okay. How is the uh, garnet doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis synthetic ab abrasives? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, uh, you know, I, uh, I I guess I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, obviously, synthetic, most synthetic abrasives, I, I think that the, the cheapest ones are aluminum oxide. So they're basically, it's alpha alumina, which is corundum. It has a hardness of nine. I don't know how, uh, uh, how it is used in certain applications. I know in the water jet cutting uh, application for uh, uh, Barton Mine Garnet, uh, the reason that they're so successful with that is because of the sharp edges on the garnet. And I don't know if synthetic abrasives have that sharp edge. You know, uh, that's really Barton's principal application now. Uh, back in the 90s and early 2000s, um, Barton was selling a lot of garnet abrasives because they were polishing TV tubes, you know, glass TV tubes back in the 90s. And that technology, of course, is, is, is gone you know, by the way of the dodo. So Barton had to reconfigure its abrasive applications. And they've really cut into this market for water jet, high pressure water jet uh, cutting. Uh, and they've, uh, they've been selling a lot of garnet doing that. And I don't know if that particular application, um, whether synthetic abrasives have an application there or not. I just don't know. It's an excellent question. I wish I could provide some more detail. All right. Well, hey, thank you very hey. much, uh, Bob. Uh, did somebody else have a question? No, I was just going to say what you were going to say, Jen. Does anyone yeah. else have a question? <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate this, Bob. You, you did a wonderful job. Thanks. I think, I think everyone appreciated your talk. I certainly did. Um, now, I'm not sure, but did, um, Joanne, was there a, did you have a trivia well, night um, planned or are we... I had, it, I had it planned, but I don't think I can do it, unfortunately. Okay. Um, yeah, because um, basically Chris usually uploads uh, the questions uh, to um, uh, actually in Zoom, and then it allows me to do um, uh, surveys, like I hit a, a button, and that 
that particular button doesn't exist tonight. <laughs> That's okay. So, yeah, we'll get, a, we'll get them next time. And okay, it's getting, it's getting late. The, the Islanders are losing one nothing. Oh, no. So we got to uh, tune into that. And uh, Bob, again, I just want to really thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule. It was a really interesting talk. And I, uh, I think I speak for everyone that we miss, uh, especially here on Long Island, hearing about hard rock geology, because we don't do a lot of it here because we don't have too many hard rocks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, well, I, I enjoyed talking about it. And thank you yeah. for uh, listening. And thank you for the excellent questions at the end. Well, thank you, Bob, and I hope we have to hope we can get you on again to talk about some other, some of your other research at some point. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, keep me keep me open. I'll I'll come down and do something. You know, that'd be, if, that'd if, be if, great. You, if, you, if you if you're going to say you're going to come down, we're going to hold you to it. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, that'll, that'll be some careful planning, but I think it could happen. <laughs> <laughs> we got a ways to go before we're traveling again. Anybody else have any questions while we're while we still have Robert on the line, Doc, uh, Dr. Darling, excuse me. Uh, I just want to also just uh, once again say thank you to Nancy for um, saving yes. the day for us so we can get this presentation going because it was very interesting. You're welcome. I will. Sorry for the kids screaming in the background. I will um, email you the, the file or the link to the file so you can share it with everybody else who's interested. I'll do that as soon as I get the streamer into bed. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you, uh, Professor Darling. We really appreciate your time. And I'm glad everybody. everyone enjoyed yeah, the talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you thank you very much. Very much. We'll right. catch everyone Bye -bye next month. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night.